Welcome, Ben Runner. It seems that ever since the concept was created, companies have used misleading advertising to sell their products. Ok, so this is a lot more regulated than it used to be, but there are still weekly news stories about adverts and commercials that have had to be withdrawn for making false claims. But false advertising is one thing, it kind of goes with the territory and is pretty much accepted these days. Putting false claims on the actual retail packaging is another thing altogether and can lead to companies getting in some very hot water indeed. But you'd be surprised just how many companies have got away with it over the years, especially in the video game industry, which is what we're all interested in and indeed the reason you're here in the first place. So in this video I'm going to be looking at 5 console boxes that were put out with misleading claims on them, nothing more than outright lies created to persuade gullible people to buy their product. Some are clearly worse than others, so I'll leave you to decide which companies should be sent to the Gulag. Atari Anonymous, my son Boris has a missile command problem. My mission in life is to save all of mankind. Lately my daughter has developed a similar problem with Atari Warlords. Now with video pinball my husband is acting funny lately. With Atari games so ingenious, so involving, so intense, I ask you Atari Anonymous, is this problem contagious? I think we should probably start off with the most well known and most publicised example of misleading box art, the original Atari video computer system box. If you look at the top row of the box about three quarters of the way along, you'll see a chess piece, which might seem pretty innocent, but actually caused quite a bit of controversy. You see, the story goes that a man sued Atari for false advertising because there was no chess game available for the console and he told the courts this was the only reason he bought the system in the first place. In response, Atari had to not only change the design of the box to remove the chess piece, but also had to create such a game for the video computer system too, although you'll notice that images of motorcycle racing, skiing and ice hockey still appear despite Atari never releasing games featuring those sports either. Now this might not sound like a particularly big deal, but the idea of creating a chess game for the Atari 2600 was considered to be impossible due to the sprite limitations of the console. The Atari 2600 was only capable of displaying three sprites in a row, or six with some clever programming tricks as seen in Space Invaders. The eight-piece wide chessboard obviously exceeded this limitation. To get around this issue, star programmer and future Activision co-founder Bob Whitehead developed a technique known as Venetian Blinds, whereby the position of each sprite changes with every scan line, which allows for eight or more sprites in a row. Additionally, the concept of bank switching ROMs was invented for the earlier prototypes of video chess, which were larger than 4 kilobytes in size. However, the released version ended up fitting inside the standard 4K ROM. Video Chess ended up being a successful product for Atari, so the extra effort was definitely worth it. But more interestingly, Bob Whitehead has stated in interviews that the whole lawsuit story is false, and he created the game off his own back. I'll leave you to decide who's telling the truth. While this certainly wasn't the first example of a misleading box design that I saw growing up, it's one that has very much stuck in my mind over the years, and one that still very much annoys me. So let's stick it straight up and get to the point. Amiga CD32, the world's first 32-bit CD games console. No, nope, nay, never, not. This is just a flat out lie that not only appeared on the CD32's box, but also on pretty much all of Commodore's advertising for the console too, and it's quite frankly flabbergasting. I was working at a branch of game when the CD32 was launched, and was actually embarrassed to even put that box on the shelf, knowing full well how wrong it was. You see, for those that might not see the issue here, there is the small matter of a Japanese console called the FM Towns Marty. This system saw its debut in February 1993 and was based on Fujitsu's existing FM Towns home computer. 
with its AMD 386SX CPU, it was most certainly 32-bit, and most certainly the world's first 32-bit console, a claim it actually used in its own advertising. Now it could be argued that the FM Towns was an obscure and unknown console from the other side of the world that nobody had even heard of, but this doesn't really hold water. I can clearly remember popular magazines of the time like CNVG and Ace reporting on the FM Towns and its amazingly advanced capabilities. For a while at least it was the dream machine of many a British teenager, and the talk of the playground amongst my friends. So with this in mind I simply can't believe that Commodore never heard of the FM Towns Marty or its 32-bit architecture, and consciously decided to mislead customers when they released a CD32 to retail some six months later. Shame on you Commodore, shame on you. I guess Fujitsu got the last laugh though, because less than a year later, Commodore were bankrupt, the CD32 had been discontinued, and the FM Towns Marty was still carving a nice little niche for itself in the land of the rising sun. For me personally, this next entry is by far the most outrageous one on this list, because it's just so hard to fathom what led Sega to commit this misleading atrocity. This one is also extremely self-explanatory, and as soon as I bring up the box for the original Japanese release of the Sega Game Gear on the screen, you'll probably spot the problem, so let's take a good look for a moment. Yep, you got it! All but one of those screenshots that make up the design aren't actually from the Game Gear, but it's even worse than it first seems, because when we ignore the wonky image of columns stuck to the handheld display and concentrate on that background, we not only spot screenshots of Master System games like Alex Kidd in Miracle World that was never released for the Game Gear, but also screenshots of 16-bit Sega Mega Drive games too. Cyberball and Moonwalker were never ported to the Game Gear, and there was no way this 8-bit portable could ever display 16-bit pixels such as these. What's more, Cyberball isn't even a Sega game. It was an arcade game by Atari Games of course, and was licensed for release on the Mega Drive through their home label Tengen. You know when you see those clone consoles from China that completely ignore what the actual product is, and are just trying to entice you with random imagery of popular games and licenses? That's what this reminded me of, and it makes my brain hurt. Why anyone at Sega thought this design was acceptable and signed it off is quite frankly staggering. Now this next entry certainly isn't a terrible crime, and is definitely the least misleading of the five, but I just had to include it, for personal reasons more than anything else. So why is the box for Atari's failed CD add-on for a failed console misleading I hear you ask? Well, it's not because of any claims that Atari might have made, and more what they were promising for its owners. You see, on the back of the box there is a panel on the bottom that shows 10 games that Jaguar CD owners should be looking out for. The big problem is that only 4 of those 10 games actually came out, and one of those is the pack-in Blue Lightning. In case you're not sure, Dragon Slayer, Battle Morph and Highlander also made it to shop shelves, but Creature Shock, Robinson's Requiem, Brett Hull NHL Hockey, Demolition Man, Jack Nicklaus Cyber Golf, and Black Eyes White Noise never saw a retail release, although all of them have since appeared in prototype form, some more complete than others. Now it's not that unusual to see the odd announced game remain unreleased, but 6 out of 10 is a pretty bad hit rate, and it surely left a lot of people feeling very disappointed, myself included. I do wonder why these particular games were chosen though, because other titles like Baldi's, Hover Strike Unconquered Lands, Primal Rage, Space Ace and Mist appeared shortly after the release of the add-on, yet don't get a mention. Surely Atari would have known what games were ready at release. But given the mess that Atari were in back in 1995, I suppose we should be glad that the Jaguar CD appeared at all. <laughs> I kept this entry until last for several reasons that I'll endeavour to explain. Firstly because it's probably the least well known example on my list, secondly because it's the most recent example that I found, and lastly because a lot of people simply wouldn't believe that a company like Sony would lie to us. But they most certainly did. Now there are a multitude of different boxes for the PlayStation 1 over its long lifetime, so I should probably point out that I'm talking about one specific piece of packaging in particular the box for the SCPH-9002 model of the PS1. 
Now that might not mean a lot, but each revision of the PlayStation has a very specific code number attached to it, and if you do a search online you'll find a breakdown of what each one means, with some models being more sought after than others. Originating from 1997, the SCPH9002 model just happens to be the one I have in my own collection, and that's how I noticed the misleading claims that prompted me to include it here. Now some other models of the PS1 did also use the same box design. I can't actually tell you exactly which ones, but it certainly seems to be the most common variation. So let's take a look at the back of that box now shall we, so you can see what it is I'm babbling on about. The top part of this shows screenshots from 15 different games, and then below this on the left hand side is a list of so called features of the console. Now I'll zoom in on those so you can get a better look, and I'll talk you through each of them in detail. So first of all there is the claim that the PlayStation is the most powerful CD-ROM console available. Now this isn't completely misleading, but it certainly wasn't the most powerful in every area. For example 2D graphics, where the Saturn would definitely have something to say. You'll notice they specifically said CD2, in order to exclude the Nintendo 64. The next one makes some fantastical claim about the console offering a fully immersive gaming experience. Now the dictionary definition says that immersive means a computer system generating a three dimensional image which appears to surround the user. This sounds more like VR to me than a spotty teenager sitting on his bed a metre or so away from an old CRT TV. Then Sony go on to claim that the PS1 offers unparalleled data storage of up to 650 megabytes. Now anyone who's been paying attention to this video already knows that this claim is utter bullshit, because the Atari Jaguar CD could store up to 790 on its CDs and there were other systems that offered more too, such as the Philips CDI that went up to 744 meg. I'll ignore the rest because they're all pretty genuine, but these first three claims were certainly pretty outlandish and indeed factually incorrect so it won't come as any surprise to learn that they were removed from future box revisions. Whether that's because Sony's rivals pointed out the lies, or whether Sony themselves realised they were taking a piss a bit is up for discussion, but at least they did the right thing. Let me tell you what bugs me about human endeavour. I've never been the human in question, have you? Mankind went to the moon. I don't even know where Grimsby is. Forget progress by proxy. Land on your own moon. It's no longer about what they can achieve out there in your behalf, but what we can experience up here in our own time. It's called mental wealth. <laughs> And that concludes my look at 5 highly misleading console boxes. Which one did you think was the most misleading and can you think of any other examples that I could have included? I always love to hear the thoughts and views of my audience so please get typing in that comment section. Before I go though, I must thank all of my little patrons for continuing to support my channel and make videos like this possible, however I must give special thanks to the following patrons in particular for their much appreciated pleasures. Mitchell Valentino, Neptune, Seth A. Robinson, Carl Olsen, Dos Gaming Man, Tiago Piera Dos Santos Silva, and Electron Star Collapse. If you also want to help support all my creative endeavours, including this YouTube channel, then please go and check out my Patreon right now. You can get access to a host of extra content, including downloads, exclusive videos, creative insights, and much more besides. I've been the Laird, I thank you for watching, and I'll see you all again for another video very soon.